Today, the super rich control a greater share of America's wealth than during the Gilded Age of the Carnegies and Rockefellers. Those are the words of Gabriel Zuckman in a recent New York Times opinion piece entitled, It's Time to Tax the Billionaires. Zuckman is an economist at the Paris School of Economics and UC Berkeley and a frequent collaborator with superstar economist Thomas Piketty, author of the extremely influential book on wealth inequality capital in the 21st century. But hold on a second. Today's guest, Phil Magnus, says the work of Piketty and his circle of inequality-obsessed colleagues is deeply flawed and sometimes outright deceptive. Let us start by looking at this first claim made by Zuckman in the New York Times. Let me bring that. So um, this graph purports to show the effective tax rate for the 400 richest Americans plummeting from 56% in 1960 to 23% in 2018, which incredibly appears lower than the 24% effective tax rate on the bottom half of income earners. So in other words, the poorest Americans are paying more of their, in, uh, a larger share of their income in taxes than are the richest. And you say this is misleading. Why? Absolutely. Well, uh, this chart, which was tweeted all over the world and uh, celebrated by Elizabeth Warren, pushed out by Gabriel Zuckman, basically manipulates the numbers to get the results that he wanted. And they do this mm. through two ways. Uh, that top line that you see there that purports to be the rate that the the wealthiest earners are taxed at, the billionaires, uh, 400 mm -hmm. richest Americans, uh, they actually suppress that rate by reallocating the share of corporate taxation uh, to the wealthiest shareholders, which is a very unconventional way of, uh, of handling corporate tax incidents. What that does is it suppresses the rate that they actually pay, at least in appearance, over time. And in the meantime, for the bottom half, the uh, lower income earners, they actually exclude intentional tax credits like the earned income tax credit and child tax credit that benefit uh, poor people by basically giving them a tax break. And it turns out if you yeah. take out the tax breaks that they have, well, shocker, the rate goes up. <laughs> so uh, basically, these two statistics are inaccurate, unrepresentative of reality, and yet they're being touted as a basis for tax sure. policy. All right. Let me talk about that first line on the top first uh, with where you say that basically they played some games with the way that corporate taxes are calculated. Could you just explain that a little bit more? Um, what did they do and why is that wrong and misleading in yeah. your mind? Well, if, if you look at corporate tax rates over time, they've generally gone in a downward trend. Uh, you go back to the mid-century, 1950s and 1960s, uh, corporations are taxed at a higher rate as are personal incomes. But that downward trend, you see uh, an succession of tax cuts that occurred mainly starting in about the 1980s and continuing to uh, the present day. And what it's done is it's reduced the rate on um, on taxes that corporations pay. Now, how do you allocate the burden of corporate taxation to people? This is a, a tricky and very complex area of economics called tax incidence economics. And we have a, a robust literature going back to the 1960s that say uh, the people that actually end up paying or shouldering the burden of corporate taxation are not necessarily the direct shareholders themselves. Shareholders do pay, uh, pay some of, uh, of the burden of it, but it also allocates onto other sectors of the economy through the distortive effects of, of taxation. Uh, so uh, there are several studies that have shown, for example, that workers, laborers, uh, incur some of the incidents of corporate taxation, whether they own the shares of the company or not. Uh, some of it right. also spills over in uh, very complex ways onto competitors. And when you do these adjustments, you do uh, uh, tax incidents calculations for corporate taxation, you have to impose a set of assumptions upon how you want to allocate those numbers. Well, uh, Zuckman and his colleague, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Sayers used to follow the economic literature pretty strictly on this. Uh, very conventional literature where they'd uh, they'd allocate a share to corporate tax uh, to uh, corporate shareholders, but they'd also allocate portions of it to some of these other people that incur incidents, and you get a really uh, uh, even distribution of the way that uh, corporate tax incidents is incurred, uh, basically spread across different sectors of the economy that economists have theorized. Well, what they did when they uh, produced this new chart is they engaged in what I would call outright statistical trickery. 
uh, they only assigned corporate tax incidents to the physical shareholders, which happened to be the rich, happened to be the wealthy. Uh, wealthy Americans owned a larger share of, uh, of, of corporate uh, shares, basically, than any other American. Uh, and as a result of that, it tilts the entire trajectory of this upper line. Uh, so basically, now it follows the succession of corporate tax rate cuts, uh, whereas previously, if you actually distributed the incidents in a uh, realistic way, uh, it would be much more flat, much more level. Why didn't they use the same methods that would be in keeping with the methods they used to use 10, 20 years ago? Well, that's the trick. I I argue that Zuckman tried to pull an academic sleight of hand. Uh, that's it, a really big accusation. It, it is. And I, I think the evidence is there for it. So yeah. if we go back to 2018, Zuckman and his colleagues uh, published an article in the, in the uh, Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is a really... A uh, well-regarded, high-end uh, academic venue, and this article used conventional allocations of uh, corporate tax incidents. They followed Arnold Harberger's uh, approach that goes all the way back to the 1960s and has been updated by some subsequent literature. But it was a very standard way, and they state this outright in the article that we are following the conventions of the field in the way we allocate corporate tax incidents. Well, this gave them a result that was at odds with their political story. Because remember, they, they're, they're claiming that tax cuts in the 1980s to the present have caused inequality to soar. But when you looked at the results, and you can see the chart there, I pulled this directly out of their data set. Uh, the incidence of taxation, the effective tax rate on the rich, so this is corporate taxes, this is income taxes, this is everything that they could measure uh, between 1962 and roughly today, so they, they took this all the way up to the mid 2010s, which is the data they had at the time. Now, this is yeah, the top 2014. Yeah, top 0.001% of earners. Uh, this is roughly 1,200 to 1,400 tax filers, so the billionaires. It's the elite of the elite. And you can see the tax rate over time. In 1962, the effective tax rate on uh, the ultra wealthy was about 44%. We'll go all the way forward to 2014. Where is it? It's just over 40%. So mm. it had gone down. And of course, there's some fluctuations over time that uh, have to do with business cycles and some other events. But it had gone down by basically about four percentage points uh, since the 1960s. That story okay. does not fit their narrative about inequality. About so their narrative, you know, in short, is inequality has, you know, massively increased over the decades that we were just reviewing. Um, and in part, that's due to the slashing of taxes on the rich. And you're saying, wait a second, no, using the, their own methods that they used to use to calculate this, you know, we're seeing a very, very similar, very consistent tax burden from the 60s exactly. until basically today. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's very slightly gone down. And this comes from streamlining the tax code. But uh, the wealthy are still shouldering far and away the largest share of the tax burden. But that and doesn't... Then yeah. Well, there, I want to I want to com let's compare it to the 2019 data, the the adjustment that you say happened. I just want to put these side by side and you explain to me why these look different. So here's 2018, which we were just explaining. It looks like, you, you know, you kind of end up in the same place you started a, a very slightly lower. And then here it is compared oh to the readjustment. Right. The orange That's line crazy. is going, you know, starting in the upper left corner, goes down below uh, 30%, you know, between 20 and 30%. So what happened here? How did they massage the data to get this result? So almost all of the change here comes from altering the way they assign corporate tax incidents. Uh, they hmm. just altered their assumptions. It's the same data input, but by changing that one little assumption, and reallocating it entirely to shareholders, they took was basically a flat line and made it a downward angle line that now fits this claim they're touting in the New York Times, where uh, you, you see the uh, the tax rate in the uh, 1960s it jumped from about 44 percent to uh, it's near 55 percent, which was the claim that he made in the New York Times. And then you go all the way forward to uh, the mid 2010s, and it's no longer 40 percent that the richer pay. They're now down to 22, 23%, which they claim is a lower rate than uh, lower income Americans are paying. So it's all because so, of changing assumptions. Yeah. So would, I mean, 
is there a possible defense of changing that uh, way of calculating? Yeah, that, was there any charitable it, explanation it, it, for why it, they don't... that it actually is? Um, you know, the fact that wealthier people own more stock. That is a that, that that is a better way to calculate where okay. the taxes are falling. Because let me pull up like one slide in there that they might make in their defense. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is also from the New York Times article that says taxes on wages has increased as t- corporate taxes have decreased. So right, the green right. line, you can see the payroll tax going up, the corporate income tax going down, and they would just argue we need to capture the fact that this means. The tax burden is shifting between, you know, uh, different levels of earning potential. Right, right. So Zuckman himself offers a defense of doing this, but he doesn't do so until after he's caught, which is the really mm-hmm. interesting giveaway. Uh, the uh, another way to think of this, they published in a top economics uh, venue, the Quarterly Journal of Economics. This means that you have to make airtight arguments that go through rigorous peer review, often multiple rounds before. Uh, top experts in the field of economics. And in doing so, when they adopted the conventional way of assigning corporate tax incidents, they met 60 plus years of academic literature that they had to go through uh, basically a screening on to show that they were doing the methods consistent and the right way with that literature. Uh, So that's how they got it published. But then Zuckman does something really interesting when he realizes he has this problem. And this is around 2019. uh, Randomly one day, he removed his data replication file from his personal website for this already published article that had come out. Well, so that's the smoking gun. That's right? the smoking gun. It just disappears, and uh, you know, several people noticed this. Does and he in, know about the Internet Archive or like the Wayback Machine? Well, well, that's, that's what caught him because yeah, he well, put, Phil he does it, about that. Unfortunately the, for exactly. him, exactly. <laughs> he, he puts this new file up, and the old one disappears. And, uh, you know, I, I was involved in, in when this originally broke, but it was a couple of other economists. I think Jeremy Warpedal, uh, who's probably He's wonderful. Yeah, sometimes co-author with him. Uh, he also noticed it about the same time and posts on Twitter. Uh, Wait a minute. There's here's a side by side of the before and after of your website. Where did your data file go? Uh, and he, he really doesn't have any answer. And then Zuckman sees all of this and kind of panics. And this is after I've called them out. I pointed out that the two charts no longer align. Uh, Jeremy yeah. and a few other economists had pointed out that uh, his website had changed. And he panics, and suddenly he reposts the old file. He puts it back up. And then a couple months go by, and he releases a new, like a white paper, a working paper, that tries to retroactively justify all of these decisions. And what he comes up with is, is this extremely heterodox viewpoint that says we need to discard the last 60 years of corporate tax incidents literature and adopt this new way that I'm proposing, which assigns the entirety of the burden directly onto uh, shareholders. Uh, This would be a more compelling argument, I would imagine, if that is the work that he had been doing prior to releasing this. But now it looks a little bit like he's attempting to salvage his own reputation and like he was caught doing something uh, pretty deceptive. Um, You know, he was caught in this you know, the web of deceit. And now he's trying to figure out a way to retrofit the data onto a new narrative. But it's like, well, wait a second. You know, if you actually believed that to the extent that you claim you do, why didn't you make that case a few years ago prior to the publication of this and prior to being caught? Well, that's exactly it. And I think the obvious answer here is, had he submitted this new heterodox way of of calculating corporate tax incidents, (laughs) he never would have made it through peer review of a top economics journal. Uh, they would have asked him, why aren't you citing Harburger 1962 in 60 plus years of, of literature ever since then? Uh, you can't just introduce this new approach that completely inverts everything we know about corporate tax incidents so, and kind of wave your hands and make uh, assert that this is the new way to do it. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. And please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.